All right, so this morning we get our first of our series of chief resident presentations for the year, um, and we get to welcome Dr. Jordan Ward. Um, Dr. Ward is originally from the Oklahoma City area. She is a first-generation college student and received a Bachelor of Arts in Molecular Biology from the Oxbridge Honors Program at William Jewett Coll Jewell College. During her time at Jewell, she spent a year studying human sciences at St. Catherine's College at the University of Oxford. She returned to Oklahoma for medical school where she attended the University of Oklahoma College of Medicine. While there, she was active in Medical Students for Choice and served as her chapter's president and curriculum reform chair. During residency here at UW, she has served on the Resident Quality and Safety Council as well as the Graduate Medical Education Committee. After residency, she plans to pursue a career as a generalist obstetrician gynecologist. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ward this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bizzuto, for that very kind um, introduction. Um, so my talk this morning is on traumatic birth experience and perinatal PTSD. Um, before I get started, I just wanted to share that my inspiration for this topic, I'm very passionate about and have clinical interest in patient communication um, and patient education. And I think that you guys will see how that kind of ties into my talk um, as I go. Um, neither myself nor the planning committee have any financial disclosures. This, there we go. Um, so for my learning objectives, um, we will define traumatic birth experience and perinatal PTSD. We'll identify risk factors for traumatic birth experience and subsequent development of perinatal PTSD. We'll describe immediate and long-term sequela of traumatic birth experience and perinatal PTSD. We'll understand screening and basic treatments of perinatal PTSD. And finally, propose strategies to reduce traumatic birth and perinatal PTSD. Um, I just wanted to make a quick note also on terminology. Um, the majority of research surrounding this topic uses gendered terminology such as mother, she, her, hers, female, et cetera, and also assumes that birthing person's partners are male or fathers. And as many of us know, not all people who give birth identify as a female or a mother. Um, during this presentation, I'll do my best to honor the breadth of the population who birth. However, recognizing that many times my verbiage may be impacted by the research that I'm referencing. So why should we care? Um, for a long time, childbirth has been considered by healthcare professionals and the public as a positive experience. However, in the past couple decades, there's been increasing attention in research and clinical practice for women with a negative or even traumatic childbirth experience. Even terms such as obstetric violence have come to light and we as providers need to have a better understanding of what is contrib contributing to this phenomenon. Mental health issues are the most frequent complication of pregnancy, though are under-recognized and under-treated. Only 20% of women with postpartum depression will seek treatment, and our understanding of and support for perinatal PTSD is even more limited. Common public perception is that PTSD is exclusive to soldiers, veterans, or victims of violence. Clinicians may be far more familiar with postpartum depression and more likely to ascribe patient symptoms to this diagnosis. Untreated perinatal PTSD may become chronic and can become highly comorbid, comorbid with substance abuse. And suicide and drug overdoses account for 20 to 30% of postpartum deaths and are the second most common cause of mortality in postpartum women. So what is a traumatic birth experience? The short answer is that if a person identifies their birth of tra as traumatic, then it was. Birth trauma is a subjective judgment of the person's total birth experience, which can be multidimensional and be impacted by numerous factors, including fear for self and the infant, medical interference, perception of personal performance, locus of control, type of delivery, ability to achieve priority expectations of their birth, adaptability when their birth expectations are not met, cultural expectations, and environmental factors. 
In 2004, one of the flagship papers investigating birth trauma and perinatal PTSD was published, and it was titled Birth Trauma in the Eye of the Beholder. In this study, 40 women who self-reported a history of traumatic birth participated. Each patient was asked to describe the experience of their traumatic birth and submit it to the research team. Kalatsi's phenomenological method was used to analyze the 40 stories. In their analysis, four themes emerged that described the essence of women's experiences of birth trauma. The first being, to care for me, was that too much to ask? To communicate with me, why was this neglected? To provide safe care, you betrayed my trust and I felt powerless. And the end justifies the means, at whose expense and at what price? So here is a list of birth traumas that are commonly referenced by patients. Um, so stillbirth or infant death, manual removal of a placenta, emergency cesarean, forceps or vacuum extraction, fetal distress, severe preeclampsia, cardiac arrest, premature birth, inadequate medical care, separation from the infant in the NICU, fear of the epidural, congenital anomalies, prolonged painful labor, inadequate pain relief, rapid delivery, postpartum hemorrhage, degrading experience, interpersonal challenges with care providers, and a loss of control. So what is the role of us providers in patients' birth trauma? The effect of birth trauma is greatly impacted by the quality of provider interactions, and this can be defined as verbal and nonverbal behaviors in relation to meeting the patient's stated and implied needs as perceived by the patient. Patients perceive that their traumatic births were often viewed as routine by clinicians. It's important to remember that even when an experience may appear uncomplicated to providers, women may still find this event traumatic if they lose a sense of control or dignity, which can arise from hostile or disrespectful interpersonal interactions. One study found that the largest category of peritraumatic hotspots, kind of referencing those ones we saw on the last slide, concerned interpersonal difficulties with care providers. And this most commonly happened in women, with women describing feeling ignored, unsupported or abandoned. So what about this term obstetric violence? Um, according to the ACOG committee opinion on caring for patients who have experienced trauma, the term obstetric violence is a non-medical term that has been used to refer to situations in which a pregnant or postpartum individual experiences disrespect, indignity, or abuse from healthcare practitioners or systems that can stem from and lead to loss of autonomy. These situations may include, for example, repeated and unnecessary vaginal examinations, unindicated episiotomy, unindicated activity and food restrictions during labor, or forced cesarean delivery. More subtle, though potentially more important manifestations may include minimization of patient symptoms and differential treatment based on race, substance use, or other characteristics. So what is perinatal PTSD? First, we must address the definition of perinatal. The definitions of perinatal differ, and this has a significant impact on the triage, screening, and treatment of perinatal PTSD, as well as on prevalence and statistics. As an example, the DSM-5 defines postpartum depression as a depressive episode with onset during pregnancy or up to four weeks postpartum, whereas the WHO defines postnatal period as up to six weeks after delivery. Researchers who focus on perinatal PTSD propose that for detection and treatment of perinatal PTSD, perinatal should encompass all of a patient's pregnancies, including miscarriage and other fetal loss, through two or more years post-delivery, and focus on whether or not the patient views their symptoms as related to the prior pregnancy versus um, just being within a specific time period. They encourage this change because most women with perinatal PTSD do not immediately recognize the nature of their problem, let alone seek treatment in the months following delivery. Recent population-based analysis of 15 years of Canadian data found that the peak incidence of maternal self-harm related death was between nine and 12 months postpartum. So perinatal PTSD can be further described as a disorder following a traumatic experience that lasts at, at least one month and occurs during pregnancy or throughout the postpartum period. The DSM-5 does not distinguish between PTSD and perinatal PTSD, 
Thus, we should evaluate based on the DSM-5 criteria for PTSD. So these criteria include meeting all of the following. A, exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence. B, presence of one or more intrusion symptoms associated with the traumatic event. C, a persistent avoidance of stimuli associated with the traumatic event. D, negative alterations in cognitions and mood associated with the traumatic event. And E, marked alterations in arousal and reactivity associated with the traumatic event. Now, I know we all love a mnemonic, right? Um, especially when doing DSM-5 criteria. Um, so we're gonna go through this mnemonic of trauma for PTSD. So T, the traumatic event, this is exposure. Um, you need one or more of these criteria or one or more of these categories to meet criteria for this letter. Um, so either directly experiencing the traumatic event, witnessing in person the event as it occurred to others, learning that the traumatic event occurred to a close family member or close friend, um, it must have been violent or um, accidental in cases of actual or threatened death to somebody else. And experiencing repeated or extreme exposure to aversive details to the traumatic event. So we've already talked about what some examples of trauma are for birthing people, such as unplanned C-section, severe postpartum hemorrhage, or stillbirth. But it's important to consider that this could also be a partner witnessing a life-threatening complication. Um, it could also be a patient with a history of prior sexual trauma experiencing boundary violations during their labor or birth. The R stands for re-experience, and this um, goes with those intrusion symptoms. So you have to have at least one or more of these bullet points. Either recurrent, involuntary, and intrusive distressing memories of the traumatic event, recurrent distressing dreams in which the content and or effect of the dream are related to the traumatic event, dissociative reactions or flashbacks in which the individual feels or acts as if the traumatic event were recurring, Intense prolonged psychological distress at exposure to internal or internal cues that symbolize or resemble aspects of the traumatic event, or marked physiological reactions to internal or external cues that symbolize or resemble an aspect of the traumatic event. The third one is avoidance. Avoidance, um, you have to meet one or both of these criteria. So avoidance of or efforts to avoid distressing memories, thoughts, or feelings about or closely associated with the traumatic event, or avoidance of or efforts to avoid external reminders, such as people, places, conversations, activities, objects, or situations that arouse distressing memories, thoughts, or feelings about or closely associated with the traumatic event. In perinatal PTSD, this avoidance may lead to poor health outcomes, for example, Someone may avoid returning to the hospital or clinic for routine cares um, after they've experienced trauma. The U stands for unable to function, and this is talking about the alterations in cognitions and mood. Um, so to meet this criteria, you need two or more of these bullet points. So inability to remember an important aspect of the traumatic event, typically due to dissociative amnesia and not factors like head injury, alcohol, or drugs. Persistent and exaggerated negative beliefs or expectations about oneself, others, the world. Like no one can be trusted or the world is a completely dangerous place. Persistent distorted cognitions about the cause or consequences of the traumatic event that lead the individual to blame themselves or others. Persistent negative emotional state like fear, horror, anger, guilt, or shame. Markedly diminished interest or participation in significant activities. Feelings of detachment or estrangement from others or persistent inability to experience positive emotion, like inability to experience happiness, satisfaction, or feelings of love. Um, untreated PTSD, um, perinatal PTSD, we know we'll talk about later, is associated with poor maternal infant bonding, and that's often due to the symptoms in this category. And finally, um, arousal and reactivity. So you have to have um, two or more of these. Um, irritable behavior and angry outbursts with little or no provocation typically expresses verbal or physical aggression toward people or objects. Reckless or self-destructive behavior, hypervigilance, exaggerated startle response, problems with concentration, or sleep disturbance. So to review, um, the mnemonic of trauma. T is the actual traumatic event or the exposure. R is re-experience or those intrusion symptoms. A is avoidance. U is unable to function, talking about those cognitive and mood disturbances. 
M is to remind you that all of these must be going on for a month to meet criteria for PTSD. And A is those um, arousal symptoms. So this is criteria, like I said, we this talk we're talking about perinatal PTSD, um, but this can be extrapolated to any diagnosis of PTSD. So considering comorbid conditions, it's important to remember that patients who have stress-related reactions to a recent trauma that's less than one month, so traumatic childbirth for our purposes, do not have PTSD but technically have an acute stress syndrome, and that may or may not develop into PTSD. Current screening protocols typically focus on postpartum depression, and women who screen positive for postpartum depression also often meet criteria for anxiety or other disorders. Perinatal PTSD is most commonly comorbid with panic disorder and generalized anxiety disorder. And many perinatal PTSD symptoms overlap with postpartum depression. For example, trouble sleeping or diminished interest in activities. And using criterion A, the exposure or the traumatic event, and B, those intrusion symptoms, can help you differentiate between these two diagnoses. So what's the prevalence of perinatal PTSD? Well, first, the lifetime prevalence of PTSD in general in the United States is about 8.7%. The data is varied, but between 20 and 48% of, women, of women in the world describe their birth experience as traumatic, with one study citing the more memorable fraction of one-third. Um, so we can think about one-third of the patients who walk in our doors will have a traumatic experience with their birth. And then the prevalence of perinatal PTSD varies um, in the data as well, ranging anywhere from 1.5 to 19%. Um, there were two meta-analyses that cited this um, prevalence as 3 to 4%. Another study cited that about 30% of patients who have a traumatic event will go on to develop perinatal PTSD. So I think leaving the room today for general practice, I think that's a helpful number to remember that about a third of patients will have a traumatic event, and about 30% of those patients will go on to develop some form of PTSD. Studies lack consensus because the different studies use different time periods or events as diagnostic for PTSD. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and in higher risk circumstances, we know that the prevalence is higher. 25% of patients experiencing miscarriage, 38% following ectopic pregnancy, and 39% who experience infant loss will go on to develop some form of perinatal PTSD. However, given lack of experience and understanding of perinatal PTSD, many individuals may remain undetected, and thus uncertainty regarding the true prevalence remains. The diathesis stress model is frequently used to understand the risk factors for developing perinatal PTSD. This model depends on a combination of the degree of antepartum vulnerability, so considering that their predisposition for the disorder is on the x-axis, as well as the events during delivery and postpartum factors, so stressors on this y-axis, which ultimately contribute to whether or not a patient develops perinatal PTSD. So if your predisposition or your risk factors antenatally are higher, you can see that it takes less stress um, to, for you to manifest the disorder. So what are some of these um, risk factors that contribute to antepartum vulnerability? A history of psychiatric disease, particularly PTSD or depression, or depression specifically in pregnancy. A history of interpersonal violence, such as se childhood sexual abuse, intimate partner violence, family violence, sexual assault, fear of childbirth, medical complications affecting pregnancy, like hyperemesis, preterm contractions, or antepartum hospitalization. A history of miscarriage, being nulliparous, having an unplanned pregnancy, having no health insurance, and a history of trauma. A prospective longitudinal study in Australia found that the most important predictive factor for developing perinatal PTSD out of all of these categories we're going to talk about is having a prior traumatic life event. These persons are especially vulnerable if they have low levels of support and or high levels of obstetric intervention. So what about events during birth? Cesarean delivery, both planned and unplanned. One study found that actually only 30% of women with emergency cesarean described their birth as traumatic. Operative vaginal delivery, third or fourth degree perineal lacerations. Loss of a pregnancy, either premature birth or stillbirth. Quality of interactions with medical staff or lack of support from the medical staff. Feeling pressured for labor induction or feelings of loss of control. <clears throat> 
lack of coherence between the anticipated birth experience and the actual experience and the number of interventions in their pregnancy and birth. Although the association between obstetric interventions and symptoms has been described as weak. For postpartum factors that contribute to risk of perinatal PTSD, um, poor coping skills, the need for a NICU stay, perceived social support, not breastfeeding as long as desired, increased physical problems after birth, and type and amount of postpartum care. There have also been studies on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on development of birth trauma and perinatal PTSD symptoms. At the height of the pandemic, COVID-19 patients, ICU patients, and women admitted for birth were the main populations in the hospital, meaning that pregnant patients were the only healthy population in the hospital. These patients were also faced with the challenge of fewer or no support persons due to visitor restrictions. One study investigated the stress response to childbirth in patients who gave birth in the first peaks of the pandemic, with most respondents in the study giving birth in March or April of 2020 and compared them to responses from persons who delivered before the pandemic. Of interest, this survey excluded patients who had tested positive for COVID-19. Patients who delivered during the COVID-19 pandemic had a significantly higher stress response to childbirth, which in turn associated with more perinatal PTSD symptoms and more problems with maternal bonding and breastfeeding. Knowing what we have already reviewed regarding risk factors for traumatic birth and perinatal PTSD, possible factors for this include fear of virus exposure to the mother or, newborn, mother or newborn during the hospital stay, a sense of reduced social support surrounding childbirth during visitor restrictions, discrepancy between their pre-pandemic birth expectations and the actual experience of giving birth during the pandemic, and unsurprisingly, elevated depression and anxiety symptoms have also been documented in postpartum women since the outbreak of COVID-19. So what about protective factors against birth trauma and perinatal PTSD? First is this concept of resilience, which is how well individuals adapt in the face of adversity, trauma, or tragedy. This is not necessarily an evidence-based intervention, but rather a framework that focuses on modifying internal assets such as coping skills and self-efficacy. It can also be integrated into interventions by strengthening and empowering a woman's positive traits and emotions. Next to strong social support. This can be from friends, family, romantic partners, professionals, or hospital staff. Social support from staff can include conversations about birthing experience, perceived helpful information provided by the hospital staff, positive relationships developed with the hospital staff, encouragement from the hospital staff in developing the parental role. Participation in birthing classes has also been proven to be a strong form of social support. Availability of social support is shown to vary among racial and ethnic groups. Hispanic women report the highest level of partner support, and African American women report low support. Notably, Hispanic immigrant culture has a foundation of family support that appears protect protective in perinatal mental health outcomes. Having a birth plan that is respected can increase feelings of satisfaction and control over the birthing experience and lower traumatic stress symptoms. When there needs to be deviation from the birth plan, the mother's involvement and decision-making process can reduce traumatic symptoms. Skin-to-skin -skin contact has also been shown to be protect protective, as well as multiparity, age over 35, adequate prenatal care, though interestingly, this was not protective, for people with um, a history of childhood abuse, and epidural use. Of note, univariate analysis showed, in some studies has shown epidural to be a risk factor for traumatic symptoms, but then in multivariate models, it's been found to be protective. This is likely explained by the fact that many stressful procedures like operative vaginal delivery, manual extraction of the placenta, episiotomy, or perineal laceration repair become worse when no suitable pain relief is present. Traumatic birth and perinatal PTSD have been shown to have immediate and long-term impacts in many areas of the birthing person's life, including mother-infant bonding and child development, future childbearing, psychological impacts, and relationships.
Maternal traumatic stress has a negative association with infant bonding and increased risk of breastfeeding failure or decision to not breastfeed. There is conflicting research on the effects of perinatal PTSD on child development and the parent-child relationship. There is some evidence for later delays in social emotional development. However, very few studies have examined this, so results should be interpreted with caution. While quantitative studies have given mixed results, qualitative studies have consistently found that perinatal PTSD can have severe effects on the parent-child relationship. Some felt that their experience gave them a negative view of their infant. Many reported struggle to initially bond. Some women recalled blaming their infants for their traumatic experience and wanting to avoid physical contact. In other cases, women felt extremely overprotective and anxious, which sometimes led to excluding others, such as parents and partners. These symptoms improved over time, but some reported it took up to one to five years to feel attached to their child. In general, parenting style of a trauma-exposed mother is more likely to be avoidant, intrusive, hostile, controlling, and overprotective. They're often less sensitive and responsive to their infants, and less emotionally available. This can lead to an increased risk for intergenerational trauma. Perinatal PTSD has been shown to affect decisions about future pregnancies. Perinatal PTS, persons with perinatal PTSD have reported fear of pregnancy and or labor and delivery that caused them to delay having another child or decide to not have any more children. When they do choose to have another child, they are often plagued with fears and anxieties that they will have another traumatic birth. According to a study of over 1,200 women enrolled in the Stockholm Birth Center trial, which evaluated a women's childbirth experience, those with a negative experience were less likely to have a second child. And this trend was persistent when you excluded women over 35 or single women. Of those with a negative experience, 38% had no more children compared to 17% of those with higher experience ratings. And very negative birth experience was associated with a longer interval to next birth at 4.2 years versus 2.4 years. There have also been shown to be negative psychological impacts of perinatal PTSD. These can include negative responses to themselves and others, dysfunctional coping strategies, feeling of a great sense of loss related to their experience of birth, motherhood, the ideal family, and or sense of self, sexual dysfunction and intimacy issues, suicidal ideation, and fear of subsequent childbirth. Perinatal PTSD affects not only mothers, but also others in their social network, including infants, other children, partners, family, and friends. Symptoms can lead to feelings of anger, anxiety, and depression, which can lead to a disconnection from motherhood and can affect choices related to their infants or family. A negative impact on the women's male partner has been described. Fathers have reported fear, anxiety, flashbacks, and nightmares related to traumatic birth. They also have endorsed feelings of inadequacy and inability to help their partners and children. This can strain the relationship some women blame their partners. Some mothers felt their partners were not supportive or did not understand their experience. In contrast, many partners felt powerless to help mothers cope. Many reported difficulty communicating with each other and increased conflict. This can also have a detrimental impact on sexual relationships, with some couples reporting that both partners avoided sex out of fear of another pregnancy, though this could lead to feelings of rejection or lack of connection. There's also documented negative impact on friendships, often due to difficulty trusting others or getting out to socialize. Within the discussion of perinatal PTSD, the impact of culture is a vital consideration. The limited research specific to perinatal PTSD thus far tends to lack information regarding racially and ethnically diverse populations. However, it is important to recognize that the prevalence rate of general PTSD is significantly higher for ethnically and racially diverse populations. One study on racial and ethnic differences in PTSD in the United States found that individuals who identify as Black had the highest rate of lifetime prevalence of PTSD. White individuals are most likely to seek treatment, which acts as a protective factor, 
Although these data are not specific to perinatal populations, they provide important insights. It's also important to consider birth experiences for racially and ethnically diverse populations as traumatic birth experiences and poor birth outcomes are risk factors for perinatal PTSD. Studies have shown that there are racial and ethnic disparities in both care type and adverse birth outcomes, including hemorrhage, perinatal infection, and maternal morbidity. The greatest cause of infant mortality in African-American infants specifically is preterm birth, and African-American infants are three times more at risk for preterm-related mortality compared to non-Hispanic white infants. Native American and African-American women reported perinatal symptoms of depression far more than Hispanic, white, and Asian women. So how do we screen? Some authors recommend screening in the population who is at high risk for perinatal PTSD, such as prior pregnancy-related trauma, intimate partner violence, physical and or sexual abuse, or history of PTSD. You'll already be performing EPDS as routine postpartum depression screening at postpartum visits. So remember which symptoms overlap with perinatal PTSD. For screening, there are a few tools out there, but the most common tool for PTSD is the Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder Checklist, or the PCL-5. It is available through the National Center for PTSD at ptsd.va.gov. It screens 20 symptoms of PTSD on a Likert scale. It can also be used to monitor symptom change during and after treatment or to make a provisional diagnosis when following DSM-5 diagnostic criteria. So this is what the PCL-5 questionnaire looks like. You'll see that it has um, 20 questions um, and they rank from zero to four, not at all, a little bit, moderately, quite a bit, or extremely. A score of 33 or higher is, um, can be used for screening and consistent with likely PTSD diagnosis. You can also make a provisional diagnosis um, because the way that these, this questionnaire is separated is it goes through those um, criteria that we talked about at the beginning for the DSM-5 criteria. So questions one through five fall into cluster B, six through seven, cluster C, eight through 14, cluster D, and 15 through 20, cluster E. You can use the score of two or moderately as presence of a symptom. And so if someone responds with at least one item in B, one item in, or one through five, one item in C or six through seven, two items in D or eight through 14, and two items in E or 15 through 20, you can make the provisional diagnosis. When considering treatments for perinatal PTSD, I would first recommend consideration of treatments for PTSD as set forth by the American Psychological Association, which include cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT, and antidepressants such as SSRIs and psychotherapy. SSRIs are effective in pregnant and lactating women with a low risk to mother and infant. Prolonged exposure therapy is another option that has been described. This is a type of um, cognitive behavioral therapy that incorporates imaginal exposure of recounting the trauma and listening to self-retelling of the trauma with the goal of lessening the physiological arousal response. It has been shown to be beneficial to women experiencing perinatal PTSD and has shown promise in populations with co-occurring substance use disorders in rural and socioeconomically deprived areas of the United States. Peer support services have also been shown to improve symptoms of perinatal PTSD. They promote a sense of community and engagement and destigmatize perinatal mental health issues. Organizations such as Postpartum Support International provide free in-person and online support groups. They may be easily accessible for underserved communities or groups among whom seeking clinical mental health treatment is stigmatized. There have also been several studies showing promising results using eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, or EMDR. And interdisciplinary care teams have also been described. One study created a system where patients with a psychological distress or vulnerability during pregnancy were identified with a pink sticker on their chart. And then healthcare professionals who are trained in perinatal mental health provided trauma-informed care to these patients. They found that during the seven years that this was implemented, their birth trauma psychological referrals decreased by 16%, and none of the participants developed trauma related to perceived poor healthcare. The benefits of debriefing have been inconclusive, um, though more consistent studies in this area are warranted. 
When considering treating or interacting with patients with perinatal PTSD or any history of trauma, it is important to consider and remember the principles of trauma-informed care. I wanted to take a brief amount of time to review the principles of trauma-informed care as outlined in the ACOG Committee opinion on caring for women who have experienced trauma. Trauma-informed care practices seek to create physical and emotional safety for survivors and rebuild their sense of control and empowerment during interactions. Doing so will not only support healthy autonomy, but also foster resiliency and improve overall health outcomes. Immediate and long-term responses to trauma are unique to each individual, but have the potential to negatively affect health outcomes. There are a multitude of known negative effects of trauma in general. There's a higher rate of chronic disease. As an example, higher post-traumatic stress severity is associated with lower HDL levels, higher triglycerides, higher blood pressure, greater BMI, and in survivors of childhood sexual trauma, a greater total number of cardiovascular risk factors. A history of trauma has been associated with lung, liver, and heart disease, as well as autoimmune disease. Also specific to obstetrics and gynecology, chronic pelvic pain, sexually transmitted infections, unintended pregnancy, conflicted feelings about pregnancy and sexuality, and difficulty with infant attachment postpartum. Trauma induces powerlessness, fear, and hopelessness, while also triggering fears of shame, guilt, rage, isolation, and disconnection. Feelings of physical and psychological safety are paramount to effective care relationships with trauma survivors, and obstetrician gynecologists should provide a safe physical and emotional environment for patients and staff. Consideration should be given to how punitive policies for late or missed visits might affect survivors of trauma, because many survivors find it difficult to even initiate a visit. Interactions should be compassionate, with expression of genuine concern and support, and survivors of trauma should be treated with respect and without judgment. Engaging in patient-centered communication and care can be accomplished by seeking patient input on how to best make them comfortable and can be particularly valuable for establishing trust and support. Offering options during care that can lessen anxiety, such as seeking permission before initiating contact, providing descriptions before and during examinations and procedures, allowing clothing to be shifted rather than removed, and agreeing to halt the examination at any time upon request are all beneficial practices. It is also imperative to recognize the value of personal agency Individual strengths and resiliency should be emphasized. At every opportunity, patients should be offered the choice to be actively involved in all decision-making regarding their care. And finally, remember the four C's of trauma-informed care, which are calm, contain, care, and cope. So for calm, it's important to pay attention to how you are feeling while you're caring for the patient. Breathe and calm yourself to help model and promote calmness for the patient and care for yourself. Contain. Ask the level of detail of trauma history that will allow the patient to maintain emotional and physical safety. Respect the time frame of your interaction and will allow you to offer patients further treatment. Care. Remember to emphasize for the patient and yourself good self-care and compassion. And cope. Remember to emphasize for the patient and yourself coping skills to build upon strength, resiliency, and hope. So where do we go from here? How can we reduce traumatic experiences in perinatal PTSD? Well, as a community, we can work to address barriers that patients and communities face in accessing mental and behavioral health, and this can be monumental. Common barriers include cultural stigma, workforce shortages, limited number of professionals with training, difficulty navigating a myriad of agencies and systems. These inadequacies are even greater in underserved communities who must also overcome financial, racial, or geographic challenges to access services. Trauma-informed clinicians should seek training in perinatal mental health, and likewise, perinatal mental health providers should increase their focus on trauma. One author proposed screening for acute stress while pa the patient is admitted postpartum, as immediate screening for traumatic stress is almost impossible in all other forms of trauma. We need more research in this area. There has been no study to date that has investigated primary prevention of traumatic birth experience. 
A few studies have investigated secondary prevention of traumatic birth experience and or perinatal PTSD, though data remains limited. We need further applied research to develop effective screening protocols and improve treatment efficacy. And ask, what about for us in the individual sense? My goal for us as clinicians is the following. To take careful histories regarding any particular fears your patients may have regarding birth. Identify any history of trauma, birth-related or otherwise. During the labor and delivery process, strive to increase your patient's sense of control. Offer them options when possible. Address any unmet expectations regarding the birth process. Watch closely in the postpartum period for early trauma-related symptoms. Screen and refer for treatment when appropriate. And finally, practice the principles of trauma-informed care. These are my references. Um, I just wanted to offer thanks to Drs. Hartenbach, Rice, and Spencer, um, who recruited me here, matched me, took a chance on me, and have mentored me to my class. Alexa, Daniel, John, Matt, Bushma, and Deanna, and to my support people at home, my husband, Patrick, and my dog, Tucker. While we pull up the chat, um, anyone here in the audience have any questions? Hello. Hi, go ahead. I'll work on this. Okay. All right. Great job, Jordan. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to some practical interventions that we could make either in like in the sort of our prenatal and postpartum care. Um, that might make us a little bit better able to address this, because a lot of this has to do with intrapartum events, but I think that it seems like there are some places we can improve our structure to better address this. Thank you, um, Vienna. For anybody who couldn't hear the question, she asked what kind of practical things can we incorporate into our maybe prenatal and postpartum care? Um, I think that it would be really helpful if we included screening for history of trauma as a routine question in our um, like new OB visits. Um, could even include it in you know the nurse um, visits over the phone can screen patients for this um, because we know that these patients are at increased risk of um, mental health issues, whether it's PTSD or otherwise. Um, and then also asking at the postpartum visit about how their birth process was. I feel like often we just we're like, oh, great, a postpartum visit. It's going to be so easy. I'm just going to review their chart, ask if they're still bleeding, and go from there. Um, so I think trying to capture how these patients experience their birth process, because what I found reading and what I emphasized is that even things that we often consider as routine, patients can perceive as traumatic. And so really taking the time and effort to ask patients about their experience and if they had any trauma. I have kind of a comment to go off of that. That was so interesting and helpful. Thank you, Jordan. Um, I think our common go-to, I think you guys might agree, is having like a two-week postpartum follow-up to check mood, which obviously I think is important, but <clears throat> hearing your like distance from delivery to onset of these symptoms was alarming because most of these people are not receiving care anymore. Um, sorry, I'm just out of breath. I saw a patient for a two-week postpartum visit the other day who is at, I would say, very high risk for having peripartum PTSD. And she was like, oh, I'm fine. Just kind of, you know, basically blew off any of questions I was trying to screen. Now I'm much more well-informed. Um, and I don't know, I think it's just something to keep in mind where, sure, we'll see her at six weeks, but maybe this is someone that we should try to incorporate a six-month follow-up or nine-month or 12-month or something, because that was an alarming difference from what we probably all assumed. Thank you for that comment. I wholeheartedly agree. Hi, Dr. Ward, amazing job per usual. 
Um, my question is just specific in terms of, did you find any literature on whether birth trauma was more associated with vaginal delivery versus cesarean delivery? Um, only in that many of the studies did cite cesarean delivery as a risk factor for a traumatic event. Though I think overall, I think a larger impact is this, the idea of a patient's um, adaptability and resiliency in, thing, in the plan not going as according to plan or um, feeling like they lost a sense of control. So I think whether or not, you know, because sometimes for patients, they come in for a planned C-section and for them that is a healing process or that is their way to avoid trauma. And so I think although C-section is cited more commonly as a risk factor, um, I think overall it's just the patient's sense of control and their experience with whatever birthing process they go through. And then a follow-up question that's not related to that, but did you find any research on who was better equipped in the postpartum period to deal with postpartum PTSD or birth trauma? Um, I think, I don't know that I found anything, um, I can't remember any specific data that I found, but I think just kind of extrapolating from what I did read, you know, I think that we, as the provider, are best attuned to ask patients these questions and screen patients and, like, build these relationships to understand when they're at risk. However, once patients have, um, once you've identified that they you're concerned they have perinatal PTSD, referral to, referral to psych would be appropriate. Is there anyone online who wants to ask a question? Go feel free and unmute at this point and ask a question. We have a very robust conversation here in person, but I just wanna give time if there's anyone online. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's Ellen Hartenbach, and I just wanted to congratulate Jordan on a great grand rounds. Um, and I think one of the most important things she talked about is um, being aware that what is so routine for us is the first experience, it, often the first birth experience for the patient and um, and having that awareness. So, you know, what we think of as a traumatic birth experience is you know, not in the same, uh, you know, galaxy is what the patients uh, perceive. And we get so uh, habituated to um, difficult obstetrical situations and outcomes that, um, that we just really need to ramp up our sensitivity to this is this person's first birth experience, first experience with the obstetrical um, uh, community and providers. Um, and, but my question in particular, Jordan, is how do we have our entire team, including um, uh, nursing and um, uh, social workers and psychologists, how, how do we, um, you know, have it be, yes, providers are, are sensitized and aware, but how do we have it be part of the routine to make sure that, that these uh, questions are, are asked and addressed? Thank you, Dr. Hartenbach. I, first of all, um, before answering your question, I think I completely agree with everything you said and that um, something that since I started reading about this and, and even part of what kind of brought me onto this interest is, you know, you see patients, you know, for example, PGY two year, you spend all of your time taking care of antepartum patients and admitting antepartum patients. And for us, it's like, oh, okay, I'm gonna go admit another 28 week PPROM patient for that patient coming to the hospital and then being told they're not leaving the hospital again until they deliver, um, among other issues. Like it's sometimes it, we just have to remember to take a step back and, and imagine what it would be like to be in that patient's shoes, um, despite the fact that you may do that same admission every single day. Um, and with regard to your question with how do we incorporate this on a larger scale, I mean, I think that's, that's the ultimate question, right? How do we... Um, get all of our healthcare teams and providers invested in um, taking care of these patients and addressing these risks. Um, I liked, I, you know, I referenced a study about the people who incorporated, I think they said, you know, pink stickers onto patients' charts. I think it would be nice maybe if we could incorporate some standardized way of assessing um, or identifying risk factors um, for patients who are at risk of trauma or who have identified trauma. 
and maybe it's, we work to incorporate some kind of trauma-informed care team or provider who can see these patients. I mean, I think this is a bigger scale project, but it certainly is not something that's out of the realm of possible. Good job, Jordan. This was great as expected. Um, I was just curious from a logistics standpoint, I know in talking about things that we can do postpartum and on our labor and delivery unit, I know that we have like code lavenders and things like that, but did you come across any, you know, logistical things in regards to who can activate those? Like what our protocol is for when we should debrief? Cause I feel like right now it's just sort of a, uh, my sense is that we should talk about this, but we don't have a unplanned hysterectomy needs to have a debrief with the patient kind of a thing. Was there anything that you came up with in preparing for this that exists either at Merit or from that standpoint? Um, I didn't investigate what protocols exist at Meritor for debriefing. The one thing that I did find that I was honestly a little disappointed in the data was I did find a Cochrane review of debriefing strategies um, and that they just, it, what they found in their review of I think seven articles was that there wasn't an impact either positive or negative with routine debriefing. Um, but the authors of that review did recognize that pretty much every study was designed in a different way. And it's really hard when you have this qualitative data to do that. So I think we just need more investigation because I think obviously all of our gestalt is that debriefing with patients is helpful. Um, but also maybe that's a false reassurance as providers. Maybe debriefing with patients is helpful to us, but it's not helpful to the patients, right? So I think there does need to be more investigation into if these are things are helpful. And um, I will get back to you on if there's any standardized protocol at Meritor. Question in the chat. I think we have time for this last question from the chat box. Um, this, hi, Dr. Ward from Oklahoma. Um, if in, in an initial screening you find that a patient has a previous traumatic event, what's the ideal next step? Encouragement for mental health treatment at that moment or just closer monitoring and more conversation during the birth experience? Thank you to Kiana, who's one of my friends from high school, who is watching from home. Um, that's a really great question. And I think that um, really the ideal next step is a, you know, screen, if they have a history of trauma, screen them at that time. Do they have current PTSD symptoms? Do they meet criteria for PTSD? Um, if they do, then yeah, you should refer them and they should be treated for PTSD. If they don't have symptoms, then, and they're pregnant, you, we know um, that they're automatically going to be at much higher risk for developing birth trauma and perinatal PTSD. So we just have to be on alert. And I think having a very frank conversation with the patient too about that is important um, and allowing um, that person to be an agent of their healthcare um, as well. Okay, um, I just wanted to follow up Dr. Wagger's point that um, for you guys, because you guys also can experience the PTSD following these events, um, a code lavender is, anybody can call a code lavender anytime, which means that people, that somebody like a chaplain comes to talk to you and debrief with you, but that is discoverable. And if you activate the UW peer support, you can go to Uconnect and Google peer support and see how to do that. You can have me or Ellen Hartenbach or somebody else not in our department who you can get support from to debrief after a tra traumatic experience in an environment that is peer, it's considered protected because it's peer review and peer support. So I just wanna make that statement for you guys as an important part. I, can John still make his point? Okay. Thank you so much, Jordan, for talking about this. I think it's a really, really important topic to always be thinking about for our patients. This might have been a little bit beyond the scope of what you talked about, but you mentioned a lot about how having good access to prenatal care and attending prenatal care is protective. Was there anything you found with respect to kind of giving good anticipatory guidance? Because I've been thinking about, you know, when we admit patients for inductions, when we're seeing them in our clinic, and really just describing what even to expect, because a lot of patients have really no idea, unfortunately. So did you find anything in the research that you looked at? Yes. Um, not explicitly talking about anticipatory guidance, but one of the clear risk factors for de development of birth trauma or perinatal PTSD was when um, patients had...
something happen that was outside of what they expected. So I think by helping coach our patients and guide them on what to expect can help them avoid that trauma. Session and with a great topic. So thank you so much, Dr. Ward, for presenting.